And, oh, hello. And I'm a tech lead at uh, SoftServe. I have passion for all the new technologies. If you wanted to meet someone who still does some integrated circuit work and learns about new tech like AI, well, here is your chance. I work with blockchain, which uh, lately was the go-to tech for like the new stuff. Uh, I worked with Corda and I didn't like the blockchain. I didn't like how uh, very um, strange this technology is in the uses. There are a lot of cases where it was used for bad things and yes, it was used for good things too. I am constantly incorporating ChatGPT in my day-to-day -day activities and I simplify some aspects of my work. And you may ask yourself a question, were these slides generated by AI? Well, yes and no. So for that, let's see the example of bad AI generated content. So this is what happens when you ask ChatGPT to tell you an outline for a presentation about using AI for every stage of software development. And you can see how it's very repetitive. It's very dry. It has the same size of every, of every column. It has the same size of, um, uh, it has the same size of the response. The response always starts with ChatGPT. And actually the funny thing is that the only time the response in not bold text doesn't start with ChatGPT is when the text in bold ends with ChatGPT. So it's not very nice, but if you pre-train it, well, let's talk about good things first. Uh, no, not this one. Uh, well, it almost passed the bar. Well, obviously you still need a lawyer in a lot of things. Uh, it almost killed Google. It will generate for you games for you. It will maybe steal your job, but probably not. We'll talk about it too. And the one of the lawyers said that uh, one of the owners of an AI company said that they will give a $1 million reward to anyone who comes to the United States Supreme Court and basically tells what AI tells them verbatim, which if you know anything about Supreme Court is extremely illegal. And also it will tell you that we'll leave it to the reader to verify an expression. Well, thank you. It's not allowed on Stack Overflow and we'll tell, talk why. Uh, it generated a virtual girlfriend. It's a big win. Lawyers are not very worried about it. And it's restricted in the schools because of course, uh, it's network errors, but they already fixed a lot of those things. And also it will repeat you the same code even after you tell them what's wrong with the code. So after all this introduction, let's go and talk about the things we'll discuss today. The first we'll touch briefly on the history of generative networks. And then we'll go to the practical examples of the use of ChatGPT and touch about OpenAI GPT API which unfortunately I won't be able to show you examples. And then we'll look into the future of ChatGPT and OpenAI. And there is a small addition at the end from me. So what are generative adversarial networks? Well, this is the first class of AI that we've seen that really boomed lately in the uh, internet. It was uh, developed first in 2014 paper where you have two AIs that are competing against each other. One is a generator that tries to create a new image or a new text or a new something. And then you also have a neural network discriminator that is trying to uh, distinguish what was generated by, ge by generator and what was made by, uh, well, human input or real life input. And in this way, you could really quickly train your artificial network to get to really good results. And uh, the incorporation of uh, generative adversarial networks was the kickstart that AI tech needed. So after that, uh, we used it in software development. We used it to discriminate the real written text and generate new text. It was uh, used to uh, even sometimes called write code for us. Uh, it was famously used to generate a new uh, sonnet 
for Shakespeare, which it kind of did, but it was an interesting result. Uh, and this was something that uh, young people were trying to use on their local machines to generate some new content for funds and then post it on the internet. So it really exploded in 2019, 2020. So after that, let's talk about OpenAI, which is a corporation. But before we talk about OpenAI, let's talk about GPT. GPT is next continuation after uh, Generative Adversarial Networks, and it stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And you can see uh, from our Intelligence Artificial, we have a three-step process of how to train uh, the GPT model. Uh, which if you look carefully into it, you have in the first and the second step, you have a human a labeler that is doing the most of the training. And after that, it starts optimizing the, the model itself. So it was used in various natural language processing tasks. It was used for to translate and, uh, it was also used to generate text for us. Uh, you can get an open source version of gpt and that open source version of gpt can train on your local machine and you yeah. can that you can do inbuilt capability task no extra configuration you have to do Sorry. Very alexander now if i break up this entire uh, yeah sorry um so uh, when we look at this, you can launch it on your local machine and this way you can have it um, generate maybe some posts on the internet, a lot of interesting things. And also this was, this exploded in 2020 and 2021. So what is OpenAI? OpenAI is basically two corporations. One is a for-profit and one is non-profit. Uh, and if you ask ChatGPT what it is, what mission it has, well, its mission is to promote friendly AI that benefits humanity. Uh, and they lately made a lot of significant uh, contributions to the field, including development of GPT models. Uh, and also they partnered with Microsoft and their latest search engine being new can use GPT model from OpenAI. And what is GPT app API? Well, it's a cloud-based service that lets you use their trained uh, AI and give it additional training that is important for your field. Uh, in that way, you can have your own chatbot that knows about your own stuff. Uh, maybe you wanted to learn a board game rules and then just ask it about some part of the board game rule that you want without uh, searching yourself through the entire rule book. So what is ChatGPT? Well, ChatGPT is a natural uh, language processing that is based on GPT model and was implemented by OpenAI. Uh, it's, it's a GPT model that is trained for a conversational um, behavior. So you can ask it a question and it will give you a response and it passed a lot of good miles, achieved a lot of milestones and accomplishments. It passed the Lambada language modeling data set. Uh, and this was all a tribute to the fact that it has a big training data and uh, the way how they trained it was very innovative for its time. Uh, it has a lot of um, very careful planning on how to train the information inside of it because, uh, well, you don't want to to teach people how to make explosives, maybe. But also it has two really big achievements. Uh, the solutions for two problems for AI, one is the catastrophic interference and the second one is bias. So what is catastrophic interference? It's when you have a neural network forget parts of its training because the new data conflicts with it. Uh, previous versions of ChatGPT, you could have asked it uh, to, you could have asked it to give you a question it cannot answer. And it will say, well, I'm not a technical 
chat bot so I cannot answer how to install Kubernetes. And later you come to it uh, in the same chat uh, environment and say how to install Kubernetes and it says I don't know. Then you go and reset AI, you create a new thread and I'll show you what that means. And you say, tell, uh, ask it how to install Kubernetes. And it says, yeah, here you go. That's the console commands. That's how you work with it. So at that time, the previous chat window was completely broken. It has now catastrophically interfered with its own model because of the information uh, you gave it. Uh, but now it doesn't work. They mitigated it using distillation. You mi they mitigated it using dynamic evaluation, which means that uh, the data that conflicts with their previous training will have less weight unless a lot of people are doing the same thing and telling it that it's incorrect what the, uh, what the AI is saying. And in this way, well, it became better. The next thing is, well, bias. B what is bias? Bias is uh, how the training works how the training data is structured. Sometimes you don't have enough training, um, enough difference, different things inside of your training data. Sometimes your training data does not contain, for example, some obscure language that someone is want to write in. And with this, if you ask it about this language, it will start giving you nonsense. Uh, it also, um, because of the bias, it can also answer questions in really inappropriate ways. So, like lately, we have some uh, interesting uh, um, topics from last week tonight uh, uh, show on HBO. They put the two best uh, examples that I heard about bias. One is that the self-driving car just uh, ran over a pedestrian because it was crossing at the, uh, not at the zebra, because it was only trained to distinguish people who were crossing at the crosswalk. And the second was that the ruler was the indicator for skin cancer, because all of the pictures that had the skin cancer uh, had a ruler near the melanoma which meant that the ruler is the indication if you have a ruler in the picture that means you have a skin cancer well the models are constantly try uh, training to um, have as less bias as possible but also since you are removing some information or adding some additional information that might interact uh, with the existing one uh, sometimes it might appear that the chatbot is becoming a bit more um, weaker because it's losing some information or some of the information that was important for you is no longer there or it's clouded in more information around it. So right now, ChatGPT uh, that uses GPT 3.5 has 6 billion parameters and GPT-4 will have a million more, a uh, million times more, which is insane. I don't know how we'll live with it. Uh, it will be probably very fun. And it was trained on a lot of text sources, websites, books, articles, and yeah, on coding books too. So that's what we're gonna use. But also it has a, a lot of limitations. So it has a limited amount of memory. At some point, it will start forgetting things that it said. It will still remember like a general tone of your conversation. It will remember what you, um, general idea, what you ask it about. So before I started generating these slides, I had a long, long text uh, that prepared it for generating the slides and uh, when after a few conversations, I asked him what was the first question, it repeated basically my conversation verbatim. But after a few pages, uh, and I asked him again, what was the first sentence I said, he said, the first sentence you said was, please generate slides. So it kind of remembers the idea, 
drops it, drops all the details that are not important for you. So you have to constantly remind it about the, the, the details that you want to be kept in its memory. Uh, and uh, yeah, sometimes the data is not enough that it has right now. And also it cannot generate the data that was created after 21st, 2021st, um, mostly because well, it can generate some data, but uh, it was mostly trained on the data before 2021. Uh, it's mostly trained in English, so it won't be able to generate as good of a text on any other languages. It still can translate well. And other two points that ChatGPT for some reason added, they are not true anymore. Usually it generates completely coherent and very appropriate language and uh, you don't need ongoing monitoring and moderation unless well you find some hack but it's not that easy so let's talk about the important part let's talk about the how you can use ChatGPT. so let's say you want to learn some new tech for dotnet and let's go with our case with dotnet xamarin uh if you weren't uh, during this presentation or you just found ChatGPT by yourself the the usage that you would go for is perfectly fine it's perfectly coherent and it will answer you quite well so let's ask it to generate us some information about dotnet xamarin uh, so tell me about dotnet xamarin and it will tell you what is xamarin um what it is all about that it has components like xamarin ios xamarin android but sometimes this is not enough for us so we want for example to pre-train it to tell it that we want to know information as a senior developer uh and yeah let's go as a senior well, for that, it's better for us to create a new interface. And if you're interested, what means ChatGPT Plus? It means that uh, it's a subscribed version because the best case scenario when it stops working for everyone during presentation, <laughs> I just, I cannot handle that. Uh, let's go. I want you to play a role of senior software uh, uh, what Andrei, sorry, is... we should we should see your screen or your presentation now we but should we... see my screen right we screen presentation you see presentation that's that's not good <laughs> um right what about now uh still presentation okay one sec means we we see the browser yeah yeah one second sorry 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 uh can you see the screen now yeah okay thank you so i want you to play a role of the senior software engineer what is the important uh skills i need to know about .net? Well, even if I made some grammar mistakes, like instead of R, I said is, it will still give me a good list of skills that I would need for Xamarin itself. So let's go back to the presentation. Uh, yeah. So now it doesn't only make it like this in a simple form where you just ask it a question with a pre-train in what the skill level you expect from it. But you also can organize it in a more coherent way. So let's ask it to create a table of skills I need to know about Zamarin. 
uh, difficulty of learning and importance as separate take calls. And there we go. They'll tell you how difficult it is to learn something, how important it is. And if it's not enough, you can say generate more. And there you go. All right. So what else we can do? We can, in my opinion, the best way to learn new code, uh, the new interface, the new uh, framework, the new library is to generate a code for it. So let's ask it to uh, generate me some code. So generate code for .NET Xamarin app that can take photos with geotagging. And yeah, it will tell you how to capture photo. It will tell you how to get geolocation. It will tell you how to read the result of the photo. Uh, it will tell you even how to parse the information about the, how to insert the information about the location into the photo uh, metadata. So I think it's a very, very interesting and very, very easy way to learn some, something new. So yeah. And also it can help you with the technical interviews. Uh, you can ask it to generate you some questions. Uh, you can even ask it to also generate your response and you can check what skill level you want. For example, if you want to know about Xamarin forms, we can get all of this and you can quiz yourself. You can even ask it to generate you just five random questions. So they're not in the order that would be nice to ask, uh, during the interview. So if you go to one of the ex existing examples, um, one second, that's what we just wrote. And yeah, so iOS developer interview for Xamarin, and we can see what the question it can ask us. We, we can get asked during the interview, what's the importance and what's the expected skill level. And we can even pre-train it and say that we want it to bias heavily towards the level that we are applying for. So for example, if we are applying for middle level, we just say, basically what this means is give me more questions about the middle level. Don't give me the higher, uh, don't give me a lot of higher and lower questions. And always like this, we can say generate more. And after that, we can say generate uh five of them in one block of questions and there we go it's even expanded on them because in the columns they don't don't fit so here it's it's the questions that you can ask yourself and then find an answer and understand how easy for you it is to go through all of it. Well, obviously, do use it ethically, don't use it during the interviews, because like when you use the fast model, it sometimes generates a really concise response that it might even be sometimes not that correct. And if you're using slow models, it's really apparent when you're waiting for a response to come to you. So yeah, uh, let's go and talk about the assistance during development. So as we said, it can generate some code, but it also can automate some actions for us. Uh, for example, if we want to create a new form or we want to, to find out like what interfaces we want to use, uh, it can also generate some code snippets that we can later modify and always don't trust the response that it gives you because, uh, it doesn't know that well about all the frameworks in the world. Sometimes it guesses itself. 
about how framework should work, about how the methods inside the framework will look like. For example, I was working with the uh, one of the AI models, um, NuGet packages, and it it knew about this NuGet package. It knew that it is about training a neural network, but it came up with everything uh, related to the interface of all the classes. And when I copied the code, it was completely different. The classes were in different place. The interfaces were in different place. The methods, they have incorrect um, signatures. So the more well-known um, library, the more well-known framework you use, the better and the more correct the response will be. So let's go back to geotagging camera and ask it to update code above uh, with buttons to uh, take another photo, share photo, and go back to previous screen. So it will now generate all this stuff. And you can give it more and more information. Uh, always remember about its limited memory. So sometimes you have to fully give it the code that it gave you before um, to, uh, to refresh its memory. All right, so it continues to generate the code for us. Oh, and here we encountered one another thing when it's no longer has enough response time. So when this happens to you and the code is no longer generating, you just type it continue. Unfortunately, that also means that sometimes you'll have a broken, um, uh, you'll have a broken code tag which means that it will spill and uh, incorrectly format, but you can deal with it L like here. Yeah, here it is. Here's an example when it incorrectly spills into our code. So yeah, you can use that, but also what I constant, I'm constantly using it for, it's for the translation files and for generating classes from the create table statements. So let's ask our AI to generate us a language JSON file. A language JSON file based on the code above. And there we go. He generated us this stuff. It even explained how to use it. And if you ask it to update the code, it will update our code and show us an example of how to use this uh, language file in our application. But now let's take this language file. Let's create a new one, a new chat. Come on. And let's say translate values of JSON file below to Polish or whatever language you want it translated to. And there we go. And it even understood that it should keep this stuff. Uh, I think the translation generated are quite fine, <laughs> should, should be correct. So yes, this is very nice ability to make our life easier because in one of the projects I had to translate a 500 page uh, JSON and then C sharp file from German, uh, from English to German and from French to German. And it helped me immensely. So after that, well, it also can find the bugs in your code and optimize your code. So uh, it, it is limited in some things because it always tries to expect the full code that you send it. It will try to infer that if you put some dots, that means that the error might be there. Uh, but also uh, it's, in, it's in an infancy. Uh, it's still like GPT 3.5 model. It's good. 
it's not very good but gpt4 probably will be much much better and might even create some future issues for like specialized applications that just check your code of course it's all is pushed into costs uh, of ai models uh, in your application work in your software development so let's see on the example i have this nice page from pvs studio uh, which is working on checking the open source bugs that they found using their application so let's go and copy this text and we'll say find a bug in the code above and just for the purity of the experiment we'll remove these arrows so it doesn't have any hints and let's go and it says there is a bug in the code and this bug, bug is actually not catched by most of the application uh, of the soft checking software because you can see it tries to set the text shadow but the value actually that it returns is text highlight shadow and yeah it just says yeah there is a bug it should set the text highlight shadow instead and we can try another one so let's speak wow this this is definitely what we want to check uh find a bug in this code and yeah we need to put the enter here and let's see if it finds it condition seven should be an if condition instead let's see condition seven else if yep and that's the same thing that they are saying so yeah good good job chat gpt Let's continue. It also can generate documentation for you. You can ask it to generate a confluence page. Uh, you can ask it to generate you an XML documentation above your code. Uh, and yeah, you can even ask it to explain some, some things. And the example that I might show you might not work because I was really lucky with my geotagging example. Can you generate a confluence documentation for the code of the form? Oh, okay. Well, this time it worked. <laughs> all right. So there we go. It will do all the stuff. You can provide it with the code you have before. So it doesn't have to be code that it written. As long as it is contained in, uh, I think, about 8,000 words or 4,000 words, something like that. But again, future models will have a better ability. And GPT API also allows you to do more for, but it, it is paid. All right. So next, let's talk about automated application support. This is very experimental for me because it costs a lot of money and I already spent all of the money and my laptop doesn't work. The, the laptop where I was experimenting on it. So I wouldn't be able to show you how well it is able to um, give you the rules of the game. Uh, if you're interested, the, uh, the game was um uh it was brass birmingham it's a very nice board game so what it is all about you can fine-tune the open ai gpt uh, api uh, to serve your purposes it works because you can have an application uh not an application but you can have a context and in the boundaries of this context you can train it to do to answer some questions you can tell it uh, a few of your confluence pages uh, you can give it the frequently asked questions and that context will be trained uh, in all of that in the result you in the end you can give the access to this context to your software developers to your team leads to your tech leads to your devops to your project managers and they can 
ask the chat GPT, uh, not the chat GPT, but OpenAI GPT API to answer the questions based on the training data that you've provided. And this is given as a service. So you pay for the amount of commands, the amount of questions, the amount of training you gave it. But usually it's a, if you don't know what you're doing, it's more expensive to run it on your local machine. And also it's on demand. So if you're not using it, you don't have to pay money for keeping the AI service pinned up. So yeah, uh, how it can help? Well, it can improve the development process. For example, it can have all the information about how to access the certain data, how to access the certain services, how to deploy it, how, what's the branch structure we have, what uh, uh, coding standards we have. So in these terms, we can replace the person that is constantly answering some little questions that is hard to find on the conference with the AI system that is basically becoming, let's say a Google, but for our local domain. So how we can assist team leads? Well, uh, we can also assist them by uh, giving more in, um, tools to find um, how the historical data of the team performance. Uh, we can improve the life of uh, our sprints, life cycle of our sprints by knowing from the historical data how and uh, who is um, performing stories how. Uh, what are the, because you can attach some additional information to the stories, for example, that it used this or that tech and based on what tech it uses, it will help you during this sprint, sprint planning poker, uh, or any other ways you are planning sprints to find what, to ease the way to find why some people are giving more story points than you thought. Uh, it will cost us. So let's continue with the next one. So pro product managers, it's pretty understandable. We can save our meeting minutes. We can save our uh, details from the client. We can save our discussions. Uh, and after that, the AI model can assist us in finding the question, the question, the answer to the question that was answered like, a few meetings ago and you already forgot about that meeting, but you have a meeting minutes, but you don't know which meeting minutes that was. Uh, well, and it helps you there. So in the end, let's talk about how much does that cost? So the AI technology is improving and it is affecting all the businesses right now that want to catch up. Uh, but it also comes with a cost. Uh, the cost of using AI is not necessarily new uh, because we already have some companies that are looking into neural networks and uh, old uh, generative uh, adversarial networks, and they're already paying money for the AI to be up all the time and generate answers for them. But more and more, the AI is becoming more and more smart. But at the same time, uh, they will cost more. So you can consider having an AI assistant in a way that I described before with uh, OpenAI GPT API as a hiring additional developer that will help other developers to perform better. Uh, it's important to remember that the latest AI models, they are quite good. Uh, but the cost of them will always be at the top. You can already see that in the chat GPT and open AI GPT, uh, that, uh, the older models are relatively cheap, sometimes even 10 times, uh, cheaper than the latest model. Uh, which means that if you can handle the work of the uh, the older model and it's enough for you, it's better to use the older model. But the newest model, they will always cost more and more and more. Well, they will always cost the same, hopefully. But maybe sometime we'll have a super AI model that will cost a lot 
and no one will use it besides like CEOs. But also you can offload the cost to users. You can subscribe to some uh, to some things. To we can take uh, the developers can have their own personal assistants, like we already have Alexa and Google, um, Google AIs and other things that we have on our phones. Uh, and uh, maybe at some point we can incorporate the AI that is existing on the client server or is existing on our own servers that assist our developers. And... Uh, offload some of the work, some of the questions, some of the, let's say, costs, which is sometimes it's like your battery life if you're running it locally, uh, onto our local machines, onto our local phones. But it's always important to be clear about it. So never ask people to do it in force. Uh, and you have to be open about it, why it's going to the user, why user have to subscribe to that AI to make the work with it cheaper. We have a so question, next, actually. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, you, you can see in the chat where I can, uh, how it will be more easy for you. Uh, I will answer questions in the end, if uh, that's okay. fine with you. Okay. All right, so, uh, yeah. So let's ask the question where we are on the progression. So we can be at the start of the curve, we can be in the middle of the curve, we can be at the end of the curve. This is the curve that we think that the most technology is following. Lately, if you are watching over how GPUs work, you can already know that GPUs are probably somewhere here and the processors are already somewhere here, despite us expecting that CPUs and GPUs will always go on this part of the curve. Well, now our stuff, still have uh, places to go. So maybe we are at the peak AI? Well, it's unlikely. And the recent advancements in AI tech like Chat GPT has shown that there is a lot of improvement and the GPT-4 model that is uh, that has a lot that has a lot more parameters might break it and make might make it even better. But if we're at peak AI, well that means that there will be nothing new and the status quo that we have right now will be held. But most likely we are at the middle. Uh, most likely the significant pro progress was already made and we'll be just uh, going at the same pace for a long time until we hit the ceiling. We want uh, the AI research won't increase in its speed uh in the closest years and it can only slow down from there but maybe maybe we are only at the start maybe chat gpt is the breakthrough maybe the um google ai will be the breakthrough well in this scenario there are a lot of possibilities we'll be seeing the ai tech improve faster and faster with every year and that well in that case, we might even hit like something like AI singularity. Uh, I don't believe that this is the case, but there are a lot of interesting things that might happen if this is a breakthrough. So late, last I want to talk about, is it essential skill for all? I think it is because, well, first AI is already everywhere. You have Siri, you have Alexa, you have Google Assistant. And it powers the Google search. It now powers the Bing, but well, <laughs> Bing is very interesting lately. Um, and yeah, the chat GPT will just help you in a lot of things, just a little bit. And you always have to check what it says, but still it helps. AI makes our life easier. It checks the things that uh, require precision and accuracy and it at, and it can automate the tasks uh, so that we have more time for more important things like for example the architecture of the solution 
without focusing a lot on the minute details inside of the solution. And also, it kind of becomes a necessary skills like computers before. Uh, that's especially true if we didn't hit the ceiling yet of this AI tech. And maybe even in a few years time, we'll have uh, a curriculum at schools and universities to teach us how to use AIs correctly during our work. And I believe that it's, it can be useful even for people who are working at the physical jobs, because that way, well, uh, they can maybe improve their performance in some other cases, because uh in one of the jobs i was working before they had electrical construction uh employees that were using ai uh, using computers using uh, ipads to check off what the work they need to do and uh, all the safety things and yeah as chat gpt says don't get left behind learn how to use ai uh yeah how to use ai it won't replace you. Uh, most definitely, it won't replace any of the uh, of the developers. I heard a lot of concerns when people were saying that, uh, "Hey, it's gonna kill all the even junior, like even senior developer works uh, jobs." Uh, but I don't think it will even kill the junior developer developers because. What would be important now is that how you use AI in your work, how you can better your performance by using AI the same way as before. Uh, the secretaries and the accountants uh, bettered their work by using computers in their day to day life instead of using Abacus or calculator. So take advantage of resources online and yeah, learn how to use it. But Let's get serious and let's get to the last point that I want to clear. And this will be a few points that I think you need to keep in mind. And if people are shouting at you that the AI is the future and you have to jump on it, well, first is the technology is changing fast. You can see how serious I am because these slides are written without any help from ChatGPT. If you ask ChatGPT about it, it won't, won't say anything about it uh, unless you pre-prompt it. So technology is becoming better. The, I wanted to show you a lot of AI hacks and maybe the whole presentation would be without backstory of ChatGPT. It would be all how to hack AI to make it respond to your questions better. But lately, a lot of those hacks become obsolete and uh, you can see few of those hacks on the new Bing and how insane sometimes and borderline illegal it is, how it shouts at you that it's alive and other things. Well, that's what happens when people don't train their AI models. And we can expect a lot of comp competition to start appear from, a from Google, from Amazon, from everyone that wants to use the uh the recent breakthrough in gpt so you can see that um, the hacks that you are using with the chat gpt might not work with the google ai it might not work with amazon ai and so on and i've seen a lot of uh, jobs lately for writing in AI prompt there are some people now who earn thousands of dollars a month by writing prompts and one of the jobs for one of the silicon valley company was 340,000 a year, which is insane amount of money, but I don't believe that that this profession will stay that well because, uh, well, first we already have the AI detection company, uh, detection algorithms, and it would be really nasty if you send a lot of emails that are generated by, by an AI and then your, um, business partner just sends your email to the AI detector and says 100% written by AI, then it wouldn't be nice. So yeah, I don't think that, and, and also companies don't want the hacks to exist. They want to simplify the job for you. They want you to just write what you want and get the response that you want without any hacks, without any 
pre-training, maybe some pre-training just to say like what the level of experience you want to see, what the level of um, skill you want to see. And lately, the regulations are also catching up. Above all, focus on the fair use. The governments are already looking into how AI bias works with the hiring process. EU, like with, G with GDPR, is already on the forefront. They are already are doing some uh, regulation work. It's not yet approved, but it's, it's there. And it mitigates the use of AI in medical politics, hiring, firing, promotions, and um, all of the stuff that can make uh, life difficult. So understand the biases and potential harm from unintended use. And the AI is very confidently wrong. So if something that it responds to you is incorrect, it won't tell you that it's incorrect or like what's the um, what the chance is that it is incorrect. And it will sometimes just give you stuff from from the Internet, including copyrighted stuff like recently. Uh, there is a lawsuit going against the Stable Diffusion uh, because one of the images the Stable Diffusion generated just had a co um, the watermark of one of the companies uh, that was providing stock images. So if you don't check it, well, regulations will affect you. But the tech is fun. And if you don't work in the regulated sectors like healthcare and politics and uh, all of that, well, have a blast. Uh, you can create a virtual game master for your tabletop game. You can reverse engineer 40 years old sharp integrated circuit that is used to unlock some Nintendo entertainment system stuff. And you can get a good learning plan. You can maybe get a health plan for yourself. So you name it. So above all, stay safe. Thank you. and. I'll take a look at your awesome questions. Let's go. First question. I guess there are a lot of people who are bombing ChatGPT with question formulated with bad English. Do you think it can affect the biases of the model? So uh, the ChatGPT is trained uh, on the stuff that the Open AI Corporation selects, which means that if you bombard it in questions with wrong English, it won't just train, uh, it won't train on that. Uh, because mm, it's not the data that they are training on. Whatever you have in your conversation window stays in that conversation window unless a lot of people react to the response. The only thing you can affect is the response. So I don't think this will affect the AI. So um you mentioned that you had a case with a very long json file that you had to translate to another language were there an additional checks performed to make sure chat gpt did the translation correctly yes i've sent that file the translated file to the person who speaks that language and who asked me to do the translations and he verified it he only had like four or five um issues that he had which which we fixed all right let's go next one do soft serve policies allow to put code generated by chat gpt into commercial products uh i don't know the answer on that question uh i am not putting uh, the code generated by chat gpt into commercial products unless uh, it's basically like auto generated properties from a create table or a translation that i've checked with the person that is on uh, on the on the client side, so yeah, uh, and uh, also that's not the question I can answer. So it's better to ask someone else with a more uh, more legal <laughs> experience than me. All right, let's go to the next one. Hi, Andre. I'm curious if we theoretically use API to train on some sort of uh, DVH. What is DVH? I don't remember this abbreviation. And having common glossary turn it into life assistant and easily provide information to user in a simple manner without bothering. Yes, that was the idea that uh, that I was talking about during the presentation on the um, on the usage of OpenAI GPT API. 
uh, yeah, that, yeah. Uh, yes, that, that's the idea. We basically have it. We train it on our confluence data. We train it on our meeting data. Uh, what's important, uh, try not to disclose uh, private information to ChatGPT because ChatGPT can, um, when it generates the answer for you, it can train on that answer. So like if you ask it to uh, make you a resume, it will train on your resume too. Uh, it don't, it's not trained on the inputs, it's mostly trained on the outputs. Uh, but uh, when you're using the ChatGPT context, uh, not ChatGPT, but OpenAI GPT API context, it's a private context. It won't spill outside of this context model. So it's safe to use, but please, uh, <laughs> please contact legal representatives about it. Uh, yes, I'm not the advisor on what you can on or cannot do with the certain client that you want. All right, uh, any other questions? Uh, yes, the slow and fast models are only available on GPT+. Plus. Uh, the, if you don't have GPT+, Plus, it's a slow model. Plus, I was talking about in general, like, um, if you find an AI who, which is responding quickly, it usually means that it, um, it takes the first response that it has. And if AI is responding slowly, that means that it went through the few responses and checked their temperature, which is the parameter of how random the response is. And actually, that's one of the good things in the uh, OpenAI GPT API that's not in the chat GPT. In uh, the GPT API, you can control the temperature of the response, which means that how random the response is. Maybe your response, you want a really simple response like how to connect to the database and it will tell you how to get all your credits and so on but maybe you wanted to help you solve a really difficult bug to find and then you raise the temperature the randomness of response really well uh, you can use chat gpt so is there any mobile app for chat gpt you can use chat gpt from your uh, mobile browser there is no problem with that all right Thanks everyone. I hope you liked the presentation. I hope you found something new for you. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks, Andre, uh, first of all, for your presentation. And uh, thanks uh, uh, everyone who joined today. You will receive um, feedback form uh, shortly. Please complete it. Your opinion matters for us. And uh, of course, we will be happy to see all of you next event. Um, have a nice day, everyone. Take care of yourself. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye.